Let's pray together. Father, we we'll bless your name. You are the one that made us and you made us for more. We're asking, Lord, today that you'll impact every life for your glory. Help us, Lord. Move us up. Move us forward in the ministry. Be glorified in every life, in every family, in every church. Be glorified in this nation. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. Another amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Once again, you remember that our theme is made for more. And today, I'm going to take uh, the scripture from John, chapter from Job, chapter 17. We're reading from verse 9. Job, chapter 17. Reading from verse 9. It says, The righteous also shall hold on his way, and he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. The possibility is there for you and for me and for everyone that knows the Lord, everyone that serves the Lord to be strong, to be stronger, to be stronger and stronger. And when it says we can be stronger and stronger, that means something continuous. We're strong, strong, stronger, stronger, and we continue to be strong. Which means then we can have more strength in the Lord. Which means we can have more ministerial breakthrough. And that's what we're talking about at this time. More strength for more ministerial breakthrough. It tells us in Psalm 684, Psalm 84, reading there from verse 7. In verse 7, it says, they go from strength to strength. Still emphasizing the same thing, that we start strong, we continue strong, and we go from strength to strength. Who are the people? Every one of them in Zion appearing before God. We come before the Lord. We stand before the Lord. We pray unto the, we make a petition unto the Lord. And as a result of that, we go from strength to strength. Many people have experienced in their ministries, in their lives for many years, they go from strength to weakness. They go from excitement to tiredness. They go from courage to discouragement. But when you wait upon the Lord, when you seek the face of the Lord, here is the experience you will have that you go from strength to strength. Everyone, without exception, everyone in Zion appearing before the Lord. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, it assures us, it says, For the Lord God is a son and shield the Lord will give grace and glory. Grace and glory. That means then the strength we're talking about, spiritual strength, supernatural strength, and sustaining strength that we have, it's because we have the grace of God that leads us to glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. We have to fulfill the condition we're walking uprightly. And as we're walking uprightly, it says no good thing will be withheld from us. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, it says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusteth in thee. Once again, we're talking about more. We're talking about more strength. We're talking about more grace. We're talking about more progress. We're talking about ministerial breakthrough. More strength for more ministerial breakthrough. I'll divide this measure to three parts. One, two, three. Number one is the promise of spiritual strength for praying believers. It's good to be a believer. 
that gets us into the kingdom. But then, when you become a praying believer, a kneeling believer, a person who is bringing petition to the Lord all the time, it says we have the promise of spiritual strength. Look at number two. Number two, we're having the power and supernatural strength for a penetrating breakthrough. We need breakthrough. Breakthrough in our personal lives. Breakthrough in our profession. Whatever we're doing for living. We need breakthrough too in the ministry. In the ministry of proclaiming the word and serving the Lord and preaching the gospel, evangelizing the world. We need a breakthrough. We need penetration. Penetration to the hearts of people. Penetration in the minds of people. We need penetration in the various provinces, in the various islands, in the various places the Lord is sending us to. We need to penetrate. And that kind of penetrating breakthrough comes as well. The power of the Lord for spiritual strength. We're looking at number three. Number three is the perseverance. Will work and sweat, will work and labor, will run and not be tired, will work and not faint. That takes perseverance. All the people got called in the past, called him Moses, or called him Joshua, or called him Elijah, or called him David. Everyone that got called in the past, they had challenges, they had things that would have stopped them. But it's because they persevered. They said, no, we will not give up. God is alive and we are alive in him. The grace of God is available. We will not give up. It is that attitude. It is that strength. It is that backbone of not giving up, persevering of the saint servants that gives us the purposeful body bearing. Number three then is the perseverance of saints, servants as purposeful body bearers. We're going to consider one by one. We're looking at number one. Number one is the promise of spiritual strength for praying believers. If you look at Isaiah chapter 40, reading from verse 28, Isaiah Chapter 40, verse 28, as thou not known, it's a question. There are many people in the kingdom of God, many people in the various churches that do not know. That's why the Lord is asking, as thou not known, you have difficulty, you have challenge, and you're drooping, you're looking back. Have you not known that, the, that uh, thou Has thou not known? Has thou not heard that the everlasting God is everlasting? Is the God of yesterday, today, and forever? Is the God of the eternal past and of the eternal future? Is the God that has no beginning and it has no end? Is the God that says, I'm God, I change not? ever alive, always alive. It's the God that was not created. The uncreated is always been. And there was no time he had not been. He was before time. He is during the period of the earth's time. And it will be when the earth has come to an end. He is the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. He has always been. And we need to rejoice that God was before the world, before, before, before anything. That everlasting God, the creator of all the earth, he, say, he tells us that he fainted not. Neither is he weary, never gets tired, never gets weary. Never gets, um, you know, fat out, fatigued. It never has any time. There's no strength. He always has the strength. And he says there's no searching of his understanding. When you think you've got 
the knowledge of God, you've got this or that, look beyond, is still there because there's no searching, searching to finality of his understanding. Look at the next verse there in verse 29. It says in verse 29, he giveth power. Remember, he giveth power. He giveth power to the people before us. He gave power. And to the people at this time, he gives power. He giveth power. He giveth to them that have no mind. And he increases strength. He increases strength. And there are people that say, I'll come, I'll pray when I feel tired, when I feel weary. Look at this. He giveth might. He increases strength. Even if you are strong, thank God you are strong, it will make you stronger. Because he giveth might and increases strength. Look at the next verse in verse 30. It says, even the youths shall faint. In human strength, the youths shall fail. In our own ability, the youth shall fail. In our naturalness, the youth shall faint. And it says the young men shall utterly fall. Not only fall, utterly fall. If all we have is the strength of the world, if all we have is the knowledge of the world, if all we have is science and history and whatever, or fall, not only fall, well, utterly fall. But in verse 31, it says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. We need to renew our strength. We need to renew our courage. We need to re renew our stamina. We need to renew the drive, the push, the sin inside us that makes us go and go and go. But it says they that wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. Think about that word, wait. That means at least you have to stand still and see that I am God. Stand still and see that I am God. Look at our society and look at where we're coming from. Look at where we are. People don't stand still. They're pushing and pushing and pushing. What happens on the road? It what happens in, a, in many lives. They're, you know, in a rush. They want to get there. They want to get there. And even when the uh, signal is telling us, your fuel, your petrol, your gas is running low. They're pushing and pushing. And we say, don't you want to top up the gas? I don't have any time for that. I'm going somewhere. I'm getting somewhere. And so the gas runs out. And we're not ready to wait. We're not ready to stop at the station there and fill up the tank. Many people are like that in their spiritual lives. They're going and going and going and running. They do not have time to wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord. I want you to think about that word wait. And as you think about Moses, he got tired. He got weary. By the time he came from the mountain, all the children of Israel had already gone after idols. And he smashed the table of stones in his hand. Where are we going now? The Lord said, I'm going to disinherit them. I'm going to tell them, you're not my people anymore. And the nation is going to die here. And Moses was told, God said, I will start all over again. And I will make you a great nation. How did that situation change? He waited upon the Lord. For how many days did he wait? Forty days he waited. And then life started again. In our lives, we have to wait. Did that wait upon the Lord? Think about Joshua. Yet he was taking the children of Israel to the land of Canaan. And somebody 
that he didn't know. I done something he didn't see. And they went to the battlefield, AI, and they were conquered. 36 people died. And then they came back. We cannot move on. And you know, the things are still ahead. Joshua, what are you going to do? Can this situation change? Yes, it will change. What are you going to do? I wait upon the Lord. He didn't have to wait for 40 days. Different strokes for different folks. Different methods for different people. He waited for a day by the evening. The Lord spoke to him. They corrected what he needed to correct. Now, waiting on the Lord is not an idle moment. You might have to discover Achan while waiting. You might have to fish out Achan while waiting. You might have to send to the camp or to the tent of Achan while waiting. You might have to dig up that thing is hiding there. Waiting period is not an idle moment. It's a praying moment. It's an active moment. It's waiting upon the Lord. We come to point number two. Point number two, we're looking at the power and the supernatural strength for penetrating breakthrough. We need to break through. And we need to move on from where we are to where we need to be. The power that comes. The supernatural stress that comes. Uh, you are already told at the point of introduction. 1973, we started a Bible study. Fifteen people. And all I knew at that time was to teach from chapter to chapter and from verse to verse in the Bible. That's where I was. That was the level I'd got to at that time, 1973, understand? I was only born again for about nine years at that time, 1964 to 1973. And I'll teach, I'll teach, I'll teach. Then I realized there is more that I am made for more. Like I remind you, you are made for more. More, more grace in your life. More strength in your life. More purpose in your life. And more drive in your life. And then I began to wait upon the Lord. And as I waited upon the Lord from teacher, I was also now an evangelist. And the Lord gave the gift of an evangelist is different from the gift of the teacher. But more and more, the evangelist came. And by the grace of God, I've gone here and there evangelizing and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not like contemporary evangelists in the New Testament evangelist. The one number one person we know as an evangelist in the New Testament is Philip. And we know that Philip went to Samaria and he preached Christ unto them. And many miracles were done. That's the example of an evangelist in the New Testament. And then after being a teacher and being an evangelist, I still waited upon the Lord. You see, if you understand, you're going from the light of the moon to the light of the sun. You're going from the light of the sun to the light of seven suns or seven days together. You keep on waiting. So I waited upon the Lord again and the Lord gave me the ministry of the pastor. And I was the ministry of the teacher, the evangelist, and the pastor. You know, many people started coming. They found the care. They found the protection. They found the provision of the shepherd for the sheep. And many of them came and became thousands and thousands in our headquarters church. And we planted thousands of churches in our country, Nigeria. And then we've gone to different countries in Africa, planting the church. We've gone to uh, countries beyond, uh, beyond Africa. And we're planting and we're still planting. I'm telling you this to tell you. You have not come to the final ceiling of your ministry. That ceiling will break up. 
And then you will go higher and higher again. And then I discovered it's one thing to be a teacher. It's another thing to be an evangelist. It's another thing to be a pastor. The prophetic ministry came as I waited and waited and waited upon the Lord. And many, many things happened. And when people came into the, you know, to the church at a time of prayer, they don't have to come and tell me we're suffering this. Can you do this? I just tell them. I said, you know, somebody is there. You have this challenge. You have this problem. Raise up your hand there. And truly, they have the problem. They raise up their hand and they will pray. Now, there is the gift of prophecy, that the gift of faith. If you have only the gift of prophecy, you know. If you don't have the gift of faith, you can't do. But when there's the gift of prophecy and the gift of faith and the gifts of healing and the gift of working miracles, everything combined together, you are able to do you as you are able to know and the prophetic gift also came actually when you think of an apostle an apostle is a teacher a pastor a prophet and evangelist all combined together and when you have all those things combined together you have the gift he gave some of them apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the defining of the body of Christ. And so, as I waited and waited and waited, you now moved me from strength to strength. Your own time has now come. Because as Moses was getting older and stepping out, Joshua's time came. As Elijah was about leaving, the time of Elisha came. As the time of David was surrounding up, the time of Solomon came. And as the time of Peter Paul rounding up, the man Mark resurfaced again. Bring him to me because he's a prophet of the ministry. The point is, the people who have gone before us, they waited upon the Lord. And the people who are coming after, like you, like you, everyone, you wait upon the Lord. And your ministry will not be limited to the person that went before you. He was the moonlight minister. And then the Lord got him to the level of the sunshine minister. And you're not saying, that's good enough for me. Joshua, you see Moses, that's good enough for me? No. Moses did not stop the sun up in the sky. But Joshua went beyond Moses. He said, when the battlefield, sun stands still there, moon stands still there. If he only went to the time, to the ministry, to the limit of Moses, he wouldn't have done that. Now, here is Jericho, and the Jericho walls are deep and high and thick. And he had to bring down the Jericho walls. Moses did not have to do that. Here was River Jordan. And River Jordan, they were to cross over. Yes, Moses divided the Red Sea. He had a rod in his hand. Joshua did not inherit that rod. Even though he did not inherit the rod, he came to River Jordan and he said, Priest, take the ark of the Lord and stand at the brink there, and as their feet stepped in the waters, then River Jordan dried up. The new generation coming will not have to carry rods around the Ark of the Covenant and the presence of Jesus Christ, represented by that Ark, is with us. Every Jordan will part. And Elisha, now, I'm about to be taken away from you. 
Ask what you want. You see, these people understood that they waited upon the Lord that the light of the moon will become like the light of the sun. They realize the light of the sun will become sevenfold. And Elijah, what do you want? Do you want the level of Elijah? And who could ever dream that you can have anything higher than what Elijah had? But Elijah knew. And I will know. And you will know that you can have more than what you have seen in Elijah. Elijah, what are you asking? Let a double portion of the Spirit come upon me. And um, Elijah said, you have asked for a hard thing. But Elisha did not accept it was a hard thing because he knew all you need to do is wait upon the Lord. I'm good. They are now in Gilgal. Stay here. No. We're now in Bethel. Stay here. No. We're now by Jordan. Stay here. No. The man had been waiting upon the Lord. That's why he was not afraid. A double portion of the Spirit come upon me. If you see me when I'm taken away from you, it will be yours. No big deal. I'll see you. I'm only looking at one thing I will see. I'm only passionate about one thing. I will see. I'm only desirous of one thing. I will see. He had 50 sons of the prophets to look at. He said, no, they mean nothing. They can't do nothing. They can't give me what I'm asking for. His eyes were on Elijah. The scenery, the beauty of that place. No, that's what he was looking at. He was not looking for sightseeing. I am looking just for one person, looking at one person, and as I see him, a double portion. That double portion will be yours in Jesus' name. But you have to wait upon the Lord. And the chariots came from heaven. And the chariots took him, took Elijah up. And he said, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel. And he was gone. And the mantle came on him. Even though the chariots are taking Elijah away, that man continued to wait upon the Lord. How do I know that? The chariots that took Elijah away were sent back. Not to take Elisha away, but to stand by with Elisha. You realize? When the army of Syria came on Elisha, and the king said, don't look for any other man. That man, catch him. Bring him here. And we'll deal with him. And then we can deal with the king of Israel. And the servant woke up in the morning and said, My Lord, my master, what are we going to do when he saw all the Assyrian armies? He said, Don't be afraid. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. And he said, Lord, open his eyes. And the Lord opened their eyes of the young man. And what did you see? The chariots of fire that took Elijah away has come to stand by for Elisha. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw the chariots of fire and horses all around them. That is the privilege and that is the experience of waiting and waiting upon the Lord. And today, as we realize the importance of waiting upon the Lord more than the people of old have got, we will get. Elijah represents the older generation. 
Elisha represents the new generation of believers. If those people of the new generation are willing to wait, we're looking at Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, we're looking at verse 8. It says, but he shall receive power. Amen. Didn't they have power already? Yes and no. In Matthew chapter 10, he gave them power and authority to heal the sick and to cast out devils. Heal the sick, cast out devils, but not the power to confront the Pharisees. Not the power to confront and stand before the Sanhedrin. They didn't have that. When Jesus was taken, arrested, they became so much afraid, they went somewhere to lock up themselves. These were the people to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. These were the people that are the keys of the kingdom, that whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth is loosed in heaven. They are the key, but they were locked up inside because of the fear. That's why Jesus said, but ye shall receive power. And if they had said, no, we have power already, no, you don't have power over your fears. You don't have power over your natural timidity. You do not have the power to open up and tell those Pharisees that we must declare that which we know you don't have that power. And when they come to challenge you and they say, did we not strictly charge you? You should not preach in this name now. You fill Jerusalem with your doctrine. Did you have the power to say it is we're going to obey God, we're not going to obey man, and say that in front of the Sanhedrin, ye shall receive power. This goes beyond power to heal, power to deliver, the power to stand. You will have the power, the power to stay in their prison and sing and break out, break the foundation of their prison, that the power is the power to be fearless, is the power to be courageous, is the power to be bold, is the power to silence the damsel, the deeds and the men that show the way of salvation, is the power to silence even the Roman government and use the roads the Roman government uh, constructed and go into all the world and make all the idolatry of the early days wiped out. That's the power we're talking about. The power that knows that you can go everywhere, you can preach the gospel, and nobody will stop you. I said nobody will stop you. It says, she shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem. 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 We're afraid. Jerusalem. We'll see where you are crucified. Jerusalem. We'll see where the people said, anybody that mentions the name of Jesus will get him out, cast him out, and will get rid of him. And Jesus said, the power you're going to receive, not just to heal, not just to deliver, not just to cast out devils, but to prevail on Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria. You remember? The first evidence and the first thing we had about Samaria, Jesus said, give me water. How can you, being a Jew, ask me a Samaritan for water? Because the Samaritans and the Jews had nothing to do together. And once they see that's a Jew, the door is closed. It's the power to open doors, close doors, and penetrate Samaria. And then it says, unto the uttermost part of the earth. Unto the uttermost part of the earth. Even cities and nations that at that time, 
they didn't recognize on the map uttermost part of the earth that the word will penetrate and spread and go there. That's why I said, ye shall receive power. Now, if the children of God, the ministers of God, the people of God said, we have power already power already. What power do you have? It says, as many as received him salvation. To them he gave power to become the sons of God. Even to them that believe on his name, if that soul will have the privilege of being children of God, the power of being children. And he will say, we have it already, we have it. No, you don't have this one. This one is yet to come. And it will come. You shall receive power after. Not before. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses. Ye shall be witnesses. You receive the power. Not just power. Your personal life. Personal salvation. Personal experience. The power that will make you witnesses. And then it says... You witness in Jerusalem, you witness in Judea, you witness in Samaria, you witness unto the uttermost part of the of the earth. Now, those apostles have gone. We are the people here. When we receive the same power, the same effect, the same result will come in our lives. You are a candidate for that power. You'll be a recipient of that power. The Lord will do it in every life. Let's come to number three now. Point number three. In number three, we're looking at the perseverance of saint servants as purposeful burden bearers. The perseverance in life if you don't have perseverance, that is, keep on going. I'm tired, take one step more. I'm weary, take another step more. I'm down, get up and go the extra mile. That's, that's what we call perseverance. Tired, you're still moving on. Weary, you're still moving on. And it's like the wind is more than the speed of the wind, more than the speed of the one that is going and going and going. And the Lord says, keep on moving on. Endure. Serve. Persevere. By the grace of God, you will make it. I will make it. I'm thinking of the possibility of the instruction given to Noah that he should build the ark. And he kept on building. One year is gone. Ten years gone. He's still building the ark for the average person. If you do something one year, five years, ten years, because the rain is coming, the flood is coming, a deluge is coming. By the time you labor and labor and build for ten years, and the rain has not come. And they're asking Uncle Noah, what happened to your rain? After ten years, I still keep on building. That's perseverance. God has given us something to do, work to do. And we're building and building and building. The Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. Ten years now you've been saying that the Lord has not come. The jeering of the people, the insult from the people, the assault from the people, and the bad utterance word from the people is enough to calm you down, cool you down. You've done it now for these ten years. And the rain has not come. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 60 years. And the rain has not come. And it kept on building, kept on building. Can we persevere 
like that. Persevere like that. I'm thinking of Moses. You are going to take the children of Israel out of the land of Canaan. On this mountain, they'll come and serve me. I'm excited. It's like, you know, something great is going to happen through Moses. And then first year, second year, third year, they were not there yet. Ten years, they were not there yet. Which person there has the temerity, the tenacity, and the endurance, and the ability to keep on moving after 12, 13, 14, 15 years, and we're not there yet, that the perseverance we're talking about. Now, he told the disciples that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Then shall the end come. Does the church have the perseverance like Noah, like Moses, that we keep on doing what he said we should keep on doing until he comes, that the perseverance we need. You've been toiling in that locality. You've been toiling in that province. And the Lord said that we should preach the gospel to every creature. And in our land, we don't have, um, we don't have even 10% of evangelical believers born again. You know, we have, maybe we have about three, four, five percent. And we've been laboring. And look at the history of the church in the Philippines all these many years. Do we have the perseverance to know that what Jesus said is we'll preach the gospel to every creature? Yes, we have the faith. We need to add perseverance. You will persevere. And we will cultivate, we'll plant the gospel, we'll reach everyone to give everyone an opportunity. In this land, you will do it. By face-to-face -face communication, one-to-one, -one, you will do it. By the radio, you'll do it. By television, you'll do it. by internet, by social media, you do it by all the ministers on ground and some of us that can come and wash your hand and strengthen your hand, you yourself, or the little help we have, we will do it. We will persevere. And if we persevere, there's not a power on earth, there's not a power from hell that can stop this great move of God. All we need to do is stay there. Endure. Persevere. And say, I'm not of the people that give up. You will not give up. It's that perseverance the Lord is looking at. And the Lord will make us to be the people we ought to be. Do we have any challenge? Are we thinking whether we can make it or not? Paul made it. You will make it. How did Paul make it? Ah, that man, he had iron constitution. No. That man, he had some constitution, strong. Because, you know, he was a forceful, prevailing Pharisee before. And you know, he carried that up. No. You know what happened? He heard the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Think about your surrounding. My grace is sufficient for you. Think about the challenge and the difficulty. And remember, my grace is sufficient for you. Look at how heavy the load you have to carry. Remember, my grace is sufficient for you. You'll go out of this place with more grace. Renewed grace. Increasing grace. And the Lord, what he did for others, he'll do for you.
We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 18. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom the glory forever and ever. Amen. God's glory will come afresh upon your life. God's strength will come afresh upon your life. And whatever evil, whatever the imagination of the enemy, thinking that you, thinking the body of ministers, thinking that the body of Christ in our land here in the Philippines, thinking that there's no power in the land to stop us. No. I said a thousand times no. I said a million times no. The Lord shall deliver you from every evil work and will preserve you unto his heavenly kingdom forever and ever. Amen. The grace of God has come again for you. Let's rise up and take that to the Lord in prayer, waiting upon the Lord. And the Lord is about to do something you never thought of. Something you never imagined in your life. That grace will carry you through. Just in a sentence or two, tell the Lord, Lord, now I receive. Lord, now I receive. Fainting gone. Fear gone. Fretfulness gone. Timidity gone. The fear of the enemy gone. The fear of religion in the land gone. Now I come and you promised more grace. I come to receive. You promised more strength. And I come to receive. You promised more courage. I come to receive life, new life, passionate, excited, driven. Lord, I come to receive assurance. I come to receive the power, the power to penetrate the land, the power to do the seemingly undoable power. Lord, I come. Stamina, strength, steadfastness. Lord, I come. The power to break through. The power to break out. The power to prevail. Lord, I come. The power to go from strength to strength. And the power to keep on bearing fruit. Lord, I come. Tell the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. In the presence of God, wait upon the Lord. At the time of prayer, wait upon the Lord. You can wait. If we cannot wait in the midst of all the believers waiting upon the Lord, can you wait alone at home? Wait upon the Lord. You know your strength. Renew your courage. Renew your passion. Renew the purposefulness of your calling as you wait upon the Lord. 
the Lord is waiting to be gracious. Waiting to strengthen you. Waiting to increase your strength. Wait upon the Lord. He's waiting to extract fear from your heart. The fear of people in the church. The fear of people outside the church. The fear of powers that be. The fear of standing when people want to shout you down, stop, collapse, crumble. The power to stand in spite of them all power. The power to endure. The power to overcome. The power to forge on, penetrate, prevail. The power to do what you have never done. The power to go where you have never been. The power to overcome. Everything that wages war against your onward movement power. The power to break up a prison. Praying, praising the Lord, singing unto the Lord. And the power to shake the prison to the very foundation power. Tell him, says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. If you if you're still as weak. As a while before you came in, wait. If you're still tired, fainting, weary, as when you came in, wait upon the Lord. If you're still as fearful, timid, as a while before, wait upon the Lord. If you're still clueless, visionless, no drive, no excitement, no power, no purpose, no pursuit, as you ever were, wait upon the Lord. If any power can still push you down. If you are not in control of yourself, in control of your calling, in control of the heavenly drive that the Lord wants upon your life, wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon Upon the Lord shall renew their strength. A change must take place there. Experiential change. Evident change. A change that is brought on by the Lord himself in your heart, in your life. A new drive. A new motion, a new direction in your life. Otherwise, you need to wait more upon the Lord. They 
that wait upon the Lord to renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings as eagles. They'll walk. They'll not be weary. They'll run. They'll not faint. Except this generation of ministers, of believers that wait upon the Lord. It's easy for the world to silence the church. And if Moses could wait those 40 days to bring revival to a nation without backbone. A nation without spiritual sight. A nation without the drive to move on and to get into the land. Except Moses had waited on the Lord those 40 days, where would Israel have been? If those who've gone before us could wait for 40 days, if the early church could wait for 10 days, and we cannot even wait for 10 minutes, where will the church be in a few years' time? If the church waited until Peter came out of the prison and he stopped waiting on the Lord on his behalf after he came out of the prison. Now we cannot see after that chapter 12 what became of Peter. Forward ministry. Onward ministry. Except the church will wait upon the Lord where will the future of the church be? Think about that. And you make up your mind. I'll not be of the people that collapse, get discouraged, cannot pray. After a few minutes, I will wait upon the Lord. They were not waiting in, in action. They were waiting purposefully. Praying. Expecting. Claiming the promises of the Lord. Wait. They that wait upon the Lord. They are the people that will renew their strength. They are the people that will mount up with wings as eagles. They are the people that will run and not faint. They are the people that will walk and not be weary. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. Let him be your strength. Let him grant you more grace to be stronger and stronger. Are you as strong as you could be? Are you as strong as you ought to be? Whatever your answer, wait. Trust him. Depend on him. He'll give you more courage, more steadfastness, 
more understanding, more power. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. A good amen from a great church. In Jesus' name, we pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for the expected power. We're asking, O oh Lord, as we wait, individually as we wait as a church you make your church in this land to go from strength to strength from power to power to become stronger and stronger we we'll pray lord in deep surrender in total surrender in absolute surrender will wait upon you and great will be the strength and the power, the purpose, the drive, the courage, the endurance, the perseverance, the penetration of the church in this land in Jesus' name. You are faithful God. What you said you'll do, you will do. Do it in every life. Do it in every minister. Do it in your church in this land. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Give greater strength to your people. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen.